Okay, so my first slide is um, an example of a man who did his bit for motor neuron disease a couple of years ago in the, the Ice Bucket Challenge. I'm not sure if anybody here participated in that. I managed to avoid it. Um, his quote was, somebody else should be doing this for me. And you will see from this video that, yes, indeed, somebody else should have been doing this for him. Somebody should be doing this for me. So that's exactly how I felt when Fiona asked me if I would talk today. I thought, surely there is somebody else in this room who has more experience than me and who could be doing this for me. I even asked one of the patients last week if she would do it for me, but she thought I was joking. Um, anyway, that was unsuccessful. I am here today. I also would have had a similar emotion a couple of years ago around the management of MND patients and would have felt that surely other teams would have more experience in this complex illness than I would have. Um, but um, Oh, so, so based on that, how did I get involved in the care of these MND patients? I have worked in the Southern Area Hospice now for over eight years, and it is one of the admission cr criteria for the hospice. But these patients mainly attend day hospice, but do have infrequent admissions to the inpatient unit, but it's usually for respite. During their respite, often they will um, have some symptom control issues um, which we were able to manage with to some level but we often called on the expertise of the local neurology team for some advice regarding the symptoms of MND and also the respiratory problems. However, over the past couple of years, since we set up our community specialist palliative care team, more of these referrals were coming to our team, really via Fiona as a speech and language therapist because of, their, um, of, the, of the difficulties with speech and with swallow. And then they had medical problems as well. So Fiona did call upon me for some help with um, some help and advice regarding their symptoms. So this prompted me to have a conversation with our local neurology team regarding the care of these patients and the appropriate follow-up for these patients. Um, and from that realised that a lot of the patients are maybe diagnosed in the trust, but they're they're then referred up to um, Colette's clinic up in the city hospital and followed up regularly there and get a great service there but no real regular follow-up in, in, in our trust with neurology teams, respiratory or GI teams. So that really got me thinking of where do we fit in, what is the role of the specialist palliative care team for these patients and as Roberta mentioned earlier palliative care is not just for cancer and that has become more and more apparent as years go on um, and when we look at the definition of palliative care being a progressive, the care of patients with progressive and curable illnesses with complex symptoms with difficult ethical issues and with a focus on multidisciplinary team working when you look at MD patients they completely fit all of those criteria exactly um, we also have a big focus on advanced care planning and, and it's, this is the patient group that it's maybe the most important for. So once I reflected on that, my question changed to, okay, maybe I am the right person, maybe we are the right team to be looking after these patients. So I, I thought about this and thought I do have my specialist training and my experience in palliative medicine. A lot of the issues of these patients overlap with the, the more general palliative care patients that we see, which mainly do have cancer. But I felt for me that I needed more experience in the care of, of motor neuron disease. So I did book myself onto a few conferences um, and then I planned a visit to um, Colette's clinic in the city in June of last year. And my reason for going to that clinic was for me to learn so that I could learn about the drugs I didn't know so much about. I could learn about when NIV was appropriate. I could learn about when rig tubes were inserted. And also I could learn about how my experience fitted in with what they were doing with the MND patients. So um, I didn't really expect that when I went to that clinic, I would then come away with two referrals. <laughs> um, but that, I suppose, highlighted the importance of us as a local palliative care team linking in with the regional neurology service and working in partnership with them. So really, the aim of what I want to do today is to share from of what I have learned from both those, pa those patients that I was referred that day to other patients that I have subsequently been referred since then and also a friend that I have um, helped look after with, with, with MND. I want to look at the symptoms that these patients have had and also the role of the medications that we use. Um, also looking at some of the challenges around those medications with side effects, difficulties administra administrating them and other, other ethical challenges associated with them. And also I want to share a wee bit of what I have learned personally from, um, from these patients. 
So the first case is a 35-year-old lady who was diagnosed in 2015 after presenting with a foot drop. Um, she is now mainly wheelchair-bound but is still managing to live independently. She has no swallowing or breathing difficulties, um, but her main issue was pain. And she attended A&E as an urgent admission um, in May, um, and she was seen by the, the, the palliative care nurses in the hospital and organised for a prompt transfer straight over to hospice from A&E. Um, her main issue was pain, um, severe leg spasms, which were partly muscular pains and partly neuropathic pains. When she arrived in hospice, she was already on baclofen 25 milligrams QID for spasms, diazepam 15 milligrams at night again for spasms and to help her sleep. She was on a non-steroidal to help with muscular pain and a Transtec patch. She also had been titrated up with, um, to a reasonably high dose of gabapentin for neuropathic pain. So during her time in hospice, um, we increased up her Transtec patch further. We introduced PRN Oromorph 10 milligrams for her pain, which was very effective, but sometimes took too long to work because her pain came very suddenly. So we then um, introduced Abstral, um, sublingual preparation, because it worked a bit quicker. She found it really effective. We did need to increase the dose to 200 micrograms, but that was helpful for her. She was started on clonazepam, half a milligram at night for neuropathic pain and to help her sleep. And she was commenced on ketamine for neuropathic pain. And the dose was so slowly titrated up to 30 milligrams three times a day. We also got our physio team involved and she benefited a lot from stretching exercises from the physio team. So she was discharged home from hospice and her pain was well controlled on discharge. Um, then after discharge, she did need a few tweaks in her medications over the, over the following few months. She had her gabapentin increased up to 1200 micrograms three times a day and her oromorph was increased to 15 milligrams and she started taking it regularly three times a day. I saw her again then just a few weeks ago at clinic and she was doing really well. She said her pain had completely resolved. She was not needing any other breakthrough doses of analgesia. She remained mobile in her wheelchair and she was actually enjoying quite a good quality of life. She was in really good form, she loved shopping and she was getting out shopping as much as she could and was still attending day therapy but often didn't have time to attend day therapy because she wanted to go and do other things that she would prefer to do. So three of the other cases I'm grouping together because there are some similarities with them. However, what has struck me a lot about a lot of these patients is that there are variations in presentation, variations in what the main issues are for these patients. So this highlights that one of these patients had poor swallow and had a rig tube inserted. They also had poor, poor communication but maintained good mobility. Another one of these patients was overall weak with really poor mobili mobility and poor speech but still managing to swallow and another one had poor mobility and good speech but, but had good speech and good swallow. So it just highlights how the, the, the main issues are different for each of these patients but for these three patients they also had their main symptom was, com was common to all three and it was respiratory secretions and much difficulty in expectorating those secretions. Two of those patients did complain of shortness of breath as well and used uh, non-invasive ventilation. And one of the patients only had respiratory distress when it, whenever he was coughing up the secretions um, but the rest of the time his breathing was comfortable and he did not need an IV. So I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about secretion management and we really uh, approach this in two different ways. The first way would be to help the patients expectorate the secretions and the ways in which we do that would be with uh, saline nebulizers to help loosen the secretions. We did try hypertonic saline nebulizers on the advice of the physio team for one of the patients but they didn't like it because it made their mouth too dry. Carbocysteine is also very effective in trying to loosen the secretions and help the patients cough them up, starting at 375 milligrams three times a day and moving up to the maximum dose of 750 milligrams three times a day. All of these patients got great benefit from the cough assist machine because they just didn't have the strength in their muscles to be able to cough the, the sputum up themselves mm -hmm. um, and that um, piece of equipment really helped them do that. Um, suction was also used in, in, in many of these patients and one of them actually needed to manually remove some of those secretions because they were so stringy and, um, and, and difficult to, to expectorate. Um, and physiotherapy was really important to help patients expectorate the sputum as well. So as well as the as approach of helping the patients actually bring up the secretions, we also then took the approach of trying to reduce the amount of secretion. And to do that, we started off with a scopoderm patch, 
starting with half a patch, which is probably less than what we would normally use in our cancer patients, but we did find that these patients were often more sensitive and experienced side effects more readily than what we would often experience in, in our normal patient population. So starting at half a patch, moving to one, to one and a half, and then to a maximum of two patches, and we, we stopped there. After the scopoderm patch, if that wasn't effective, we then considered the oral solution of glycopronium. And for us as palliative care physicians, we're probably more familiar with glycopronium in a syringe driver for cancer patients with secretions at the end of life, but actually in the MND <coughs> patients using it in the oral route, either orally or via the rig tube, um, was very effective for them. The dose is different, but we used um, subcuts, so it started at 200 micrograms three times a day with a plan to increase by 200 micrograms three times a day to get to a maximum dose of one milligram three times a day. If the, if the combination of the scopoderm and the glycoperonium didn't work, we then stopped the scopoderm patch and moved to hyacine hydrobromide in a syringe driver. So that is the same drug that is in the scopoderm patch, but it allows us to go higher with the dose. So the scopoderm patch is the equivalent of 600 micrograms in the syringe driver. So we'd start with that with a view of slowly increasing the dose in 100 milligram increments to get to the maximum of 1200 micrograms over 24 hours. We also need to remember if, if part of the production of, of, of secretions is because of infection that we need to treat that with antibiotics as well. So this approach is a wee bit different to what we're used to with our cancer patients because normally we're used to seeing secretions happen at the very end of life in cancer patients who are in the last days of life and we try to expectorate until the patient is too weak to be able to expectorate. We then stop all the drugs that are helping expectorate and focus on drying up. But actually for these MND patients using both those approaches at the same time did turn out to be, to be very appropriate for them. The other drugs that were used to help dry up the secretions that we would be less maybe familiar with in the cancer world would be propranolol one person had. It was difficult to tell how much benefit they had from that. One person had atropine eye drops um, dropped into their mouth. Um, this particular patient didn't find it helpful, but other patients have. And another patient had Botox injections into their salivary gland, which they actually did find really effective, and that enabled the doses of the glycopronium to be able to be reduced. So as well as the, the chest secretions, um, as you've already heard, shortness of breath and anxiety and panic can also be a, be a big feature. And we found that in some of these patients who had difficulty coughing up these secretions, that that caused a lot of anxiety and panic around that time. Some of the patients did have shortness of breath as a, a, as a more constant problem and used NIV for that. Some of the other patients just got really distressed with the coughing. So the medications for that were um, a sublingual lorazepam, half a milligram or one milligram PRN for severe episodes of, of anxiety or shortness of breath. Some patients used diazepam, which was slightly longer acting than the lorazepam and can, was, was helpful as a more regular dose of maybe two milligrams two or three times a day. And also oromorph is extremely beneficial for shortness of breath in these patients. But again, we start with very low doses and maybe lower doses than we normally start with our cancer patients. So starting with maybe one milligram PRN, moving to one milligram four times a day, and then moving up to two milligrams and beyond as the patient <coughs> needs it and is able to tolerate it. And then for a lot of these patients who maybe have difficulty swallowing oral tablets or who don't have a rig tube to allow us to administer um, oral medication via the rig, we then used a syringe driver um, and with diamorphine and midazolam to help with anxiety and panic and shortness of breath. Um, many of these patients at the end of life, even if they did have a rig tube for liquid medications, still benefited from that constant administration of the drug over the 24 hours that a syringe driver um, provides for us. We also found PRN midazolam very helpful and the buccal preparation of that was something really useful for patients who, particularly patients who were at home and maybe didn't have access to a nurse immediately to give them a subcut injection. It was something that we could teach the family how to give a buccal preparation of midazolam, which was really helpful to empower the family to be able to give them something whenever they're distressed. These patients did have other issues as well. I wanted to focus on secretions because that was the main issue, but um, some of those patients had, had nausea. Um, that was either due to the rig feeds causing nausea or one person actually had nausea because of the scopoderm patch. Metoclopramide was a really useful drug if it was a rig feed associated fullness and nausea and vomiting and really helped um, improve GI motility. If it wasn't that, often we'll use cyclosine, possibly add in a small dose of haloperidol. And then our third line for nausea would be the use of legomopromazine. 
A few of these patients also were troubled with constipation as well, um, and I'm not going to go into detail with constipation management, but just to, to highlight that using, starting with a softening laxative, adding in a stimulant laxative if needs be, and then to add in something osmotic like lactulose or laxido can be really helpful as well. Some of the patients did need PR intervention to help with constipation too. And one of the patients did suffer from abdominal cramps, which Boscopan was helpful for. <coughs> so the last case, um, I mentioned to you earlier that I was involved um, in the care of a friend who was diagnosed <coughs> with, with MND. Um, she presented with foot drop um, in 2015 when she was working in the South of Ireland as a minister. Um, and managed to work on for some time, um, but then as things became a wee bit more complex and challenging, then came back to Northern Ireland, and um, I met her then again in October 2016, at which point her mobility was poor, and she was beginning to get more short of breath and was on NIV at night. But um, her, she was managing really well with her speech and her swallow, but was getting weaker. So in anticipation of the swallow getting worse, and the fact that she was fit for a procedure, a decision was made to insert a rig tube in November 2016. But after the procedure, she did have a rough period um, with an infection, constipation, and generalised weakness. Um, so from the Royal, she was then transferred to Thompson House, where she'd been before for periods of respite, which had gone really well. And during that time, the bed became available for her to stay there more long term, which was really good because it was a fantastic um, place which looked after patients with long term neurological conditions, um, but also somewhere that was very convenient in terms of location for family, which was fantastic. So um, her son Stephen is actually here today. So instead of me telling you all about her symptoms, I have taken the opportunity of inviting Stephen up to join me to give you, give you his perspective on what her main challenging symptoms were. Thank you, Stephen. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> So I just want to ask you, Stephen, from your perspective, um, Liz often used Stephen as her spokesperson as her speech got worse, and she would have called Stephen in to be the person who communicated with the staff around what the main issues were. So from your perspective, Stephen, as her spokesperson, what do you think the most challenging symptoms were for your mum? Yeah, um, <coughs> I suppose just even listen to, to your talk and the, the one before, um, it's, it's all the symptoms, they're, they're all there, and you know, we recognise so, so many of them. We recognise the fact that um, it, there's a, a lot of change, uh, a lot of fast, you know, what, what would have been an issue, say, a few weeks ago, now, a few weeks on, it's actually something else has, 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 has cropped up. So uh, I think the problem with the symptoms is trying to keep up with them. Um, in the fast, so mum's was slightly uh, a more aggressive type, which meant that her, um, I suppose, to, to keep up with, with, with it was was was, was tricky. Um, symptoms, you know, things that haven't haven't been been mentioned was um, mum fell um, and had two or three breaks, which also had to be dealt with. Um, in the earlier stages, you know, she started off with the. The foot drop, and that was something which I think can just happen as any accident happens, but just puts a whole different flavour of uh, of treatment and management. Uh, whenever the difficult decision for her swallowing, I think probably on on reflection, her symptoms relating to keeping her swallowing going. Um, because well, nobody wants to give up your ability to swallow, but her 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 want, her desire to keep that going while I was there, maybe on reflection, was part of. Um, there didn't help in terms of just things going down the wrong way, and there's the right word for it, but you know what I mean. Uh, and then all the other problems because of that. So just the uh, have it. Uh, trying to, to get secretions up um, so th it, it sort of came and went you know that's the the breathing the constipation was it, did, did, did the drugs then go too far did it come back again and just trying to fine tune and, and balance um, we were very very blessed by 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 just the the, the way that the bed arrived at Thompson House Hospital and uh, she was there for seven months seven months altogether, I think, and um, just 
during that time, the, 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 the spell of here's the issue, what can we do about it, that was greatly um, re reduced, which, which was great. Uh, Mum Mom was very on top of things. Um, she, would, she knew exactly what was going into her, um, maybe too much so I'd say she'd probably be uh, you know, very on, on, on top of her game for, for wondering is that causing this and if so can I be, that dose be reduced. Um, I, I think too in terms of, of symptoms it would be another reflection at this stage that perhaps as healthcare professionals that we need to be a little bit more proactive in not waiting for the symptoms to emerge but to flag up these are the symptoms that you're probably going to get and to just go through a little bullet point list not in the sense that you're going to scare people off but the fact that by, by raising them means that ah that was talked about that's what that is and I think that would, would be something that could greatly reduce anxiety for patients whenever they encounter those, those things, not only for patients but for, for family members too, because we can remember things. We say, oh, do you remember um, the, the, the nurse or that person said, that's what you might get, that's what that is, and that's okay. And so it's not something else, just really, really <coughs> up with the, the symptoms at, at that stage. Um, so what's helpful in, in addressing the, these challenges? I think just access to the right healthcare professional um, and the right type of one who has experience um, so, I mean, it was a, a one, we felt very blessed as a family that we knew Tracy and that she was able to uh, flag up lots of, lots of things to, to be present as, a, as an ear, as advice, um, along with other healthcare professionals uh, to be able to, to link in it. And that certainly for, for us as a family helped a lot. Is there anything okay. else? That no, that was brilliant. No, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. I really appreciate that. Thank you. So I learned a lot from Liz. As I said, um, she was a minister, um, and even when she stopped officially working as a minister, she carried on doing that right through her whole illness, and she touched the lives of every person that she met. Um, she didn't get frightened by the fact that this illness was incurable and, that, and what that meant for prognosis. She actually saw the time factor as an opportunity, an opportunity to prepare herself and to pre prepare other people and to do the things in life that she wanted to complete. Um, so she lived her life as well as she could, um, despite the limitations and coped really well with the challenges and loss that come with this diagnosis. And there were things that were a loss like the things that she liked doing, like walking and playing golf and, and running and eating fish and chips. Um, but um, there were other things that she, she then took on that were new things, like writing poetry that she wanted to do that she couldn't do because she was too busy um, in her earlier life. And she, she used the extra time to do that. And she's written a book um, and that's published, which is amazing. Um, and she got amazing strength from her faith. Um, and that really carried her through to the very end. And that allowed her to, to not have that fear and anxiety at the end. Um, and I read a quote recently in a book that talked about facing death unafraid, without fright or a fight, and perhaps with a smile. And that was her. So back to the medications. Stephen's made a really good point that um, these symptoms were waxing and waning. One week there was something, one week there was something else. And that was for her, but that was also for all of these other patients as well. And to be perfectly honest, I find that the most frustrating thing. I'm used to symptoms progressing and us increasing drugs, occasionally pulling them back, but generally we can go one direction with drugs. With these patients, we were trying drugs, they were working, then they stopped working. They worked for some people, they didn't work for other people. Um, then you got side effects, you had to change them or reduce them. And then three weeks later, you could reintroduce them again. And they tolerated them. So it it was challenging from that point of view and I suppose um, there was just a learning and constantly reassessing things, changing things if needs be. Um, uh, and you joke about your mum, you know, suggesting all of those things but she was very wise because sometimes things just did need to be changed and adapted but that, that can also be difficult and challenging. 
when you look at all the drugs that I've mentioned in this presentation, um, I could spend a whole hour talking to you about potential side effects, but we don't want to do that. All I want to do is pick out the, some of the key side effects that these particular five patients did experience. So one of them had quite significant pain with bisacodyl suppositories, which was something that we wouldn't normally see. So it was just interesting to manage that. Um, scopoderm caused some problems in some of the patients. Um, one patient has no, had nausea. One patient had quite profound confusion with increasing doses of scopoderm, and we actually had to stop it in the end because of that. And quite a number of patients complained of dry mouth with scopoderm. Again, with the glycopronium, similar. Dry mouth <coughs> caused problematic. But also, interestingly, and something, again, we wouldn't see much in our cancer patients. Constipation and urinary retention were a problem with glycopronium and that really limited the, the speed in which we could increase the dose of it. Um, I already mentioned the hypertonic saline nebs caused a dry mouth in one person. And interestingly, I've already touched on it, that sometimes we do use drugs like to try and dry secretions, but at the same time trying to help them expectorate secretions. Sometimes we're doing things that maybe don't seem logical or seem like they might appear counteractive, but actually there is reason for both those approaches at the same time. As well as side effects from medications, obviously there's other difficulties with medications. These patients have difficulty swallowing, and even the ones who didn't have rig tubes still had some element of difficulty swallowing. So we tended to have to use liquid medications rather than tablets, and um, some of those liquid medications um, just don't taste nice. Um, we did a, a research experiment with our palliative medicine colleagues and we were all supposed to taste them all, and really they don't taste nice. So the patients that... Um, that the, the drugs that these patients mentioned were metoclopramide, docusate and codanthum, that they didn't like the taste of. There's also the challenge around the muscle weakness and the dexterity of being able to then manage those drugs, particularly <coughs> when they are liquid medications and particularly when it's drawing up oral oromorph or oral ketamine in a syringe and sometimes the patients just can't do that themselves and we are relying on district nurses who can't always be there to do it and then we're relying on family members, which is a big responsibility when it's those kind of drugs. Um, and then with the swallowing difficulties, we need to look at other ways in which we can administer those drugs. So patches are very helpful for pain, um, sublingual preparations and buccal preparations that I've already mentioned, and then of, of course subcut preparations and syringe drivers. I don't want to touch too much on feeding and ventilations, but that's going to be dealt with later in the day, but I just want to place it in context of these patients. Two of these five patients had rig feeding, three of the five patients had <coughs> MIV. One of the persons stated in their advanced care plan that they didn't want any artificial feeding or ventilation. One patient, uh, and one patient said they just didn't want any, any feeding. And there was one person who may have needed feeding but wasn't fit for the insertion of a rig. The main problems that we saw with these interventions in the patients were nausea or fullness with the feeds. Metoclopramide was helpful with that, but as the patients neared the end of life, then we took a different approach. And instead of trying to focus on nutrition, we then, we, we, we shifted the focus a wee bit more to just comfort and um, gave enough feed that helped ease any hunger but didn't push the feed to the place that it would make them nauseated because we were having you know, we were just more focusing on quality of life rather than maintaining life at that point and um, one of the patients had a, a very distended stomach and bile and we wondered whether NIV may have contributed to that Again, Colin's going to talk to us about advanced care planning later, so I'm not going to dwell on it. Um, but four out of these five patients had an advanced care plan. And the kind of things they had on those advanced care plans were three of them stated they didn't want resuscitation, two didn't want artificial feeding, one didn't want ventilation, one did have NIV, but specifically stated they didn't want to go to ICU or didn't want a tracheostomy, two did not want admission to acute hospital. Um, and interestingly, only one of these patients really did have an acute admission to hospital for an aspiration pneumonia. The rest of the patients we did manage to keep out of hospital. Um, and one patient didn't want antibiotics at the end of life unless it was necessary to ease symptoms. So in terms of place of care, there are challenges associated with that. And I have mentioned hospice. It's an admission criteria for hospice. Um, patients go to day hospice and can come in for respite or symptom control. The problem is that um, 
hospice isn't a place where we can provide long-term care in the same way as Liz was able to go to um, Thompson House for seven months. We just don't have the facility there and some peop people do need that. We also can't provide one-to-one -one care and that was a limitation for one of the other patients because they just needed so much one-to-one -one support. However, we got around that. That patient did come in. We did get extra staff. We did get the training we needed in the use of the cough assist machine that we were a wee bit rusty on. So we facilitated two of the patients coming into hospice and we offered hospice to two of the other patients but they didn't need it. Obviously home in the ideal world is probably what most people's preference would be and um, all of these patients were cared for at home for some, for some time of their illness. Two of them did die at home um, but home is limited as, as, as well. Um, there's only carers four times a day. We, there's district nurses, Mellon nurses. There is some out of hours cover but it certainly isn't a 24 hours a day service and that is a lot of responsibility for family members particularly when there's so many complexities of this illness. So it, it, it's just often not possible. Nursing home, again, sometimes it's just too complex for the patients to be looked after in nursing home. Um, and we've heard of, a, of um, your really positive experience with a long-term neurological unit, but we don't have a unit like that in the, in the Southern Trust. So what else have I learned from these patients? Um, if you go through the internet and the MND Association website and the Telegraph website, you will find many, many stories um, of inspirational stories of people who have coped with MND. And I could have shared some of those today, but I did not feel the need to because these five patients have been a real inspiration to me. Um, one of them was very weak when they were diagnosed and had a fairly short, short um, illness, but the others showed such strength and resiliation um, throughout this illness. And they carried on living their lives the best they could, doing the things they enjoyed doing, like getting out and about when they could, going on holiday when they could, um, going out for day trips, spent time with their family um, and but the important thing was they really needed their family and their friends to be able to facilitate them doing that um, and that was um, a, a really important aspect of the quality of their care was the support they got from the people around them. So in summary um, specialist palliative care teams do I think have an important role in the care of MND patients but we don't know everything. We, have, we do have appropriate knowledge of symptom control issues. Um, may need to be adapted slightly, but we can do that. But there are some as aspects of this illness we're not experts in. We can't put rig tubes in, we can't manage NIV. Um, and, and we don't know about all the drugs that um, Colette uses in her clinic. So we do need to use our colleagues and we need to work in, in partnership with the MND team, with the respiratory and the GI specialists, and also in our own multidisciplinary team. Um, all, all of the members of the team are needed for this. And we also need to work really closely with the patient and with the family. And we need to be brave in our conversations. We've talked about the importance of advanced care planning. They're not easy conversations to have, but it is invaluable um, whenever the patient can't communicate their wishes for us as healthcare professionals to know that we are doing the right thing by those patients. And it also takes a huge burden off the family members from feeling that they are responsible for making those decisions. But, um, so it's really helpful to know what the patient wants and it means that we can focus on really patient-centered care. We also need to be willing to learn from these patients um, and I have really found sharing the journey of the illness with, with all of these five patients has been an absolute privilege. We have a lot to offer but we also have much, much more to learn from these patients. So I just want to finish with a quote from Benjamin Franklin which says, many people die at 25 and aren't buried until they're 75. This is not what I experienced for these five patients. They continued to live the life the best they could, despite the challenges that MND brought to them. They still enjoyed what they could still, what they were still able to enjoy. And I hope sharing these stories will inspire me and everybody here to do the same.